Good evening, and welcome to this Kenyan Review Reading with Ilya Kaminsky and Molly McCulley-Brown. I am Elizabeth Dark, Associate Director of Programs for the Kenyan Review, and we are delighted to have you with us this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few things to help usher you through your time with us. If you would like to access closed captioning for this evening, you may do so by following the link that is about to appear into the, in the chat. This will provide you with a link that you can open in a new window to follow the conversation. Also, if at any point you experience technical difficulties, please email the Kenyan Review at kenyan.edu where a staff member is waiting to assist you. For tonight's reading, we will be presenting the text of the poems side by side with each poet. As an attendee, you will have the ability to change the relative size of each window as you wish. Uh, I'm gonna actually read from the slide to tell you how to do this. Um, on a computer, you can hover over the pointer or hover your pointer over the boundary between the shared screens and then the participant's video I'm sorry, <laughs> let me try that again. Hover your pointer over the boundary between the shared screen and participants video until your pointer changes to a double arrow and then you'll see a gray line separating both views. If you click on that and drag it, you can make the speaker larger or you can make the text larger. If you are joining us by phone, you can tap on the window that you want to enlarge and then pinch it to make it larger or smaller. Again, if you're having any technical difficulties with that, feel free to email, email us. And again, that email is in the chat. Um, our chat will remain open for greetings and positive comments from our audience. But if you have any questions you would like to ask us during the Q&A portion of the evening, which will follow after the reading, please submit those using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And feel free to submit these at any time as we will be collecting these questions throughout the evening. As this evening progresses, we will be placing in the chat links to Molly and Ilya's websites, as well as a link to our bookshop store, should you wish to purchase any of their books. And now, as Molly joins me on the screen, I will note that this reading is in connection with our year-long project entitled, In My Time, A Narrative Space, which, in, which invites our community into literary engagement during the pandemic year, fraught with uncertainty, grief, and distance. We welcome you to join us as we explore Kenyon's campus-wide theme of learning, unlearning, and relearning through literature and creative writing. I'd also, I'm also happy to share with you that as an audience member tonight, you are the first to hear about the Kenyan Review's new Ross event series, which will be running online this summer in correspondence with our Kenyan Review Writers Workshops. This series will include 22 events consisting of conversations and readings from some of the best living writers today. Keep an eye on your inbox as we will be sending you specifically more information about this next week. But we will now begin tonight's reading with an introduction to our first poet, Molly McCulley Brown, who will be introduced to you by her fellow fellow, Ms. Rye. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that. And thank you for um, asking me to uh, introduce Molly. Before I sort of like um, read out her very impressive biography, I thought I would tell you a small, a short story about how Molly and I met and why she is so important to me and to the community at Kenyan. So when Molly came to um, Gambia almost two years ago now, I just had a minor tragedy. Um, my apartment had sort of gotten flooded under and et cetera. And I'd, I was living in the basement of this very kind woman who had like taken me in. And I was in a terrible mood and Molly has seen me in terrible moods far too often than, Anyone should, but she had. Um, but I was in a terrible mood and she'd invited me to dinner and I was trying to get out of it, honestly. And then I thought, you know what, I'll just go. It'll be 10 minutes. We don't really know each other. What will we have to say to each other? And so I turned up to this dinner into this apartment that smelled amazing and met a person who had the most beautiful smile. And for some reason, when she says bananas, it makes me laugh. 
and uh, had made the best dinner and looked up at me and she said, how are you? And it took us all of two minutes and we were like, all right, we're going to be friends forever. And we must have talked for like four hours straight. And I was already half in love with her. But then she did the most incredible thing, which is that she gave me the manuscript that would become uh, places I've taken my body to read. And I took it home and I read it and I, I was in tears. I was moved. I was in tears. And also there was this amazing thing that happens when you realize you like someone a great deal and then you realize you respect them. And it's the best kind of friendship that you can have with someone. And I realized I was going to be so lucky to have, um, to be her friend, to hopefully be her friend for the next two years and forever, but to have her at Kenyon. So, you know, she's, she's tricky like that. Like she'll feed you and she'll bow you with her talent. And I'm so, so incredibly lucky that I've had her in my life. And uh, having said that, I will now give the traditional introduction because I think everybody should know how brilliant she is. So Molly McCully Brown is the author of the essay collection, Places I've Taken My Body, which was published in the United States in June, 2020 by Persia Books and released in the United Kingdom in March of 2021 by Faber and Faber and the poetry collection, The Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and the Feeble-Minded, which won the 20, 2016 Lexi Rudnitsky First Book Prize and was named a New York Times Critics' Top Book of 2017. With Susanna Nevison, she is also the co-author of the poetry collection In the Field Between Us. She has been the recipient of the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling uh, Scholarship, a United States Artist Fellowship, a Chetivela Civitella Ranieri Foundation Fellowship and the Jeff Baskins Writers Fellowship from the Oxford American Magazine. Her po po poems and essays have appeared in the Paris Review, Tin House, The Guardian, Virginia Quarterly Review, Vogue, The New York Times, and elsewhere. Raised in rural Virginia, she is a graduate of Bard College at Simons Rock, Stanford University, and the University of Mississippi, where she received her MFA. And I can proudly say that she's off to Old Dominion to teach MFA students, to raise and teach MFA students, and to love all things writing. Please help me welcome Molly McCully Brown. Thank you so much, Misha. Nobody warned me about that introduction and that I was going to get a little bit teary um, after that. Um, your friendship has been a pleasure. Bearing witness to your work has been a pleasure. Um, and I feel minorly heartbroken um, that our, our time at the review is coming to an end. But it is such a gift to be here tonight um, in the presence of all of my wonderful colleagues and particularly to read with Ilya Kaminsky, um, who is a a hero um, and a writer whose work has meant an extraordinary amount to me. Um, I'm going to read this evening from two separate projects. Um, the these first three poems come from my first collection, which is called The Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble Minded. Um, and what you need to know is that the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble Minded was a real place that in the early and mid 1900s was a government run residential hospital that was one of the major hubs of the American eugenics movement. Um, and what that means is that uh, during that time, thousands and thousands of people who either had or were perceived to have a variety of physical and intellectual disabilities were forcibly committed and forcibly sterilized there not only without their consent, but often without their knowledge. Um, and these first three poems are set um, in that place, in that time, and on those grounds. This is called Grand Mal Seizure. There's however it is you call, and there's whatever it is you're calling to. July, I sew my own dress from calico and lace. August, they take it off me in the colony traded in for standard issue Virginia cotton. Not much room for my body in the heavy slip. Maybe that's the idea. For a while, the abandoning was rare, and then it was not and would never be again. Imagine you are an animal in your own throat. The dormitory has a pitched dark roof and a high porch. We are not allowed outside. Instead, we go to the window and make a game of racing dogwood blossoms knocked down by the wind. Choose your flower as it falls and see whose is the first to hit the clay. I beat the crippled girl every day for a week. The trick is to pick the smaller petals. Most nights they knock the bedsheet in my mouth so I will not bite my tongue. 
lay out on the pine floor, rattle your own bones back to the center of the world. In the beds, the smell of kerosene and lye, the girls wake themselves one after another, spasm, whimper, whine. Outside, cicadas, in the distance, the big house lights. Another truck comes loud up the road, bearing another girl. There is whatever it is you're calling to, there is however it is you call. Labor. If you have the body for it, you're bound for the fields. To pick strawberries and coax the milk from cows or hired out to make baking powder biscuits and gravy, to sweep floors and wash and fold a stranger's clothes. You come back on a truck after sunset, raw and ragged, covered in flour, tobacco or clay. You come back bone tired and bruised, burned dead out and ready to be shut away. You sleep. I know all this from stories. I do not have the body for it. I do not go to the fields or the barns or the parlors of other folks' houses. I wake at sunrise when they wake the rest, lie in bed till somebody hauls me out and puts me by the window. Lord, I know, to want to work's a foolish thing to those who've got a body built for working. I was as close to born here as you can get, brought twisted and mewling to the gates and left. Since then, I am one long echo of somebody else's life. Every understanding that I have is scrap, is shard, is secondhand. Distance, the space between the porch railing and the rise of the Blue Ridge. Water, what comes from a bucket to my body on Sundays, what I open my mouth for morning and night. Sex, the days the girls come back smelling of whiskey, snuff, and sweat, and something sharp. Every other thing I see is a ghost. Whatever it is you were born to do, sweetheart, there's no doing it here. Make peace with small labors, your own hand drawing a needle through a torn sheet, your elbow bending as you soak clothes in the washroom downstairs. The storm that tears the azaleas apart along the road outside, that's it for beauty. Or also there's the way at night, the girls in nearby beds teach one another to cuss. Whisper, God damn it, you bastard. Sigh, God damn it all to hell. You know, before they brought me here, I'd never seen a ghost or anything that wasn't really there. I'd never heard a voice half asleep in the blackness and had to wonder whether or not it belonged to a body. But after the swearing, someone has been singing me hymns from home. Canaan's land, the spirit shall return, traveling on. In the daylight, no one ever sings. Sometimes in the doorway, I think I see a hem trailing away outside, but there's nowhere to leave to. And nobody, sweetheart, nobody has a dress that long or lace. So as you can tell, I wanted to start things off um, on a really cheerful note uh, this evening, but I'm hoping to, to pick things up at least a little bit from here because the second project um, while it's also interested in medical history and the record, as much of my work is, is also interested in community and communion and the power of friendship. Um, the poems that I'm going to read next come from a collaborative collection that I wrote with the poet Susanna Nevison, um, who is one of my dearest friends, in addition to being one of the writers that I admire most in the world. Um, and this is a book that we undertook together after realizing that our shared history of disability and surgical intervention also meant a shared history of the language and metaphor and image that arises from that experience um, and an ability to speak to one another um, in a way that we could talk to almost no one else. And so these epistolary poems are letters that we wrote either to one another or to a maker figure who was at once a god and a surgeon and a kind of artist 
figure. Um, and Susanna was kind enough to allow me to read not only my own letters, um, but some of hers tonight. And I'm not gonna say much between these poems because I think the conversation speaks for itself. Dear Maker, Look at the marble table, the cleaver, and the stars they built to watch the butchering. The human constellations cut into the ceiling there. Hosts of older god and men of science line shoulder to shoulder, sharp as buzzards on the walls. I'm half a world away from the country I was born in, and this is not a church. But maker, look, here is what I believe in. All those years ago, they butterflied a body just to put their hands inside, learn ligament, lymph node, liver, and lung, how one piece dictates another, how a creature runs. One man bent over another and forgot himself, thought, look, what's done can be undone and redone better. Took a chisel and a saw and some string to the body, pared away error, practiced what would one day make me. How to see the body as a country you can section and redraw without a sacrifice. Look, here your face clouds over. Here a whole new kind of grief is born out under whittled stars. Dear S, today the doctor's office called to say he'd see me in November and take every photograph at once my knees and hips and back to see what's what. And I heard, survey the damage, tell your fortune, reach right in, cast you out. And all my smaller selves, they hunkered down like children, tender in their fear, swore that they'd file down their claws and fall in line or let me loose if that was what I wanted, begged me to keep them a secret, not to hold them out there in the light. Years ago, they spent a long time in the theater, fumbling their blocking, being stretched and prodded, asked to pose, stitched together, rent apart. There are so many star charts made in their image, so many maps of how they move. But then there was this mess of wild, unwatched years. My hair grew long, my selves grew wedded to their unseen galaxy. They want no cartograph, no telescope. They want neither to know or to be known. S, I have been asking for an answer, a relief map. I have begged to be found out. Now some maker readies the camera, readies the compass, readies the knife, and all of me rallies to pull the curtains closed to cover my face. Dear M, there's no going back, no clearing to be found, no curling ring of grass where an animal bedded down cries out and breaks me open because she's calling back to me wherever I still wait from wherever it is we first learned the bodies, another door, the world slams shut each time we think to drag ourselves out of the line of sight beyond the scope of whatever hand would yoke us to each other, would have us bent and humbled, poor machines, Poor beasts whose tongues learn first to cry and then to speak, who can't go home when where we're from is already gone, already burning down, graven inside of us like every ancient tree. So we always know who we belong to, where we belong, where there's no going back or getting lost or found. Dear S, we are rewound, grow smaller and more animal, come back unstitched. The hands inside of us rise up into their sleeves. The knives are sheathed. The needle punctures weave together, perfect, blank, then absent. Our tendons tighten down. Our bones go back to bowing. We curl. Some hoof returns. The bodies that we know revert to fictions from a place we didn't go. And where we are, it's snowing. And we're sheltered the way wild, loved things are when they are new. A nest of winter grass, a little down, some hollow where the weather strains to reach. Say that we've never been afraid. We've never howled, we've never been in pain. There's still a storm outside. There's still some larger thing with teeth. There's still the day something will nose us to get up and walk, then run. And when we can't, we'll leave without us, fearing yet another winter or a gun.
Dear M, would you say that once the trees were bedded down, the seeds of them like us caught in the dark, that they broke themselves open to know what lurked inside? If they could last, if they could turn in time to press against the earth? Would you say that birth is the first hard frost we somehow just survive? And that like us, the trees learn spring isn't fast or kind, but another way the world takes stock of what's allowed to stay? A crowd of green masks above our faces closes in like trees. Whatever happens next is never ours to say. And I'll leave you all with this final letter. Dear S, if the trees know birth is just another word for loss, that there's a cost to shifting from seed to sapling, all the shards of what you were that don't outlast the passage into light, the way the weather breaks across your back just when you learn its shape, splits and scars the wood. How if you list in one direction, there's a whole side of the forest you'll never see. Then God, I love it that they do it anyway. Become themselves and stand there each spring as it batters them to blooming. Asks, what would you weather just to call yourself alive? Thank you. And I have the great pleasure now of introducing Ilya Kaminsky. In her memoir, A Journey with Two Maps, the poet Evan Boland, who left us just last year, writes that whatever the disruptions of time and distance, poets imagine each other. They think and think until their own sense of the narrow streets of Florence explains the light and passion of Paradiso. They imagine the cattle train bringing Mandelstam to Smirsk or the freezing room in Devon where Sylvia Plath works. It's in these fires of rapport, she says, that poets have found and loved one another for centuries. To be a writer or a reader of poetry then is to be an ongoing conversation, not just across miles, countries, continents, and languages, but across those centuries themselves a grateful and evolving and profoundly necessary kind of dialogue that outlasts our individual lives and work. To my mind, no poet knows this more deeply or embodies it more fully than Ilya Kaminsky, whose life and work and endlessly fortifying Twitter feed are a constant reminder of the urgency, possibilities, and paradoxes of poetic conversation. His poems have been translated into over 20 languages, and alongside his own writing, he's worked as an editor, a translator, and teacher. His work won the Los Angeles Times Book Award, the Ansfield Wolf Book Award, the National Jewish Book Award, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Whiting Award, I could go on. His most recent book, Deaf Republic, was a New York Times notable book for 2019, and was also named Best Book of 2019 by dozens of publications. It was shortlisted for the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the T.S. Eliot Prize in the UK, among others. But frankly, none of these extraordinary accomplishments impresses me as much as the fact that the first thing everybody says when they talk about Ilya is that he's kind, and that the poetic conversations he so expertly cultivates are inclusive, service-oriented, embracing, and warm. He's also a phenomenal reader, as you're about to experience. His poems have meant an enormous amount to me, and it's an honor to share this space with him tonight and to introduce him now. Please join me in welcoming Ilya Kaminsky. Thank you so, so much, Molly, for your all one beautiful, beautiful, and very moving reading, and for this kind words. I'm beyond grateful. Thank you. And I want to thank Elizabeth uh, for organizing it all so beautifully for us and to the students who shared their work with me today. And for you who are here, there's some wonderful, amazing people here in the audience today. And I'm very grateful to be with you. Um, and thank you, Abe, Sam, Emma, and Alicia for making this possible for us to be here now. Um, Kevin said that I hope it's okay if I just turn to poems. Um, I speak with a pretty heavy accent, so hopefully you can follow on the screen. The first poem is called 
You live it happily. Doing so well. We live it happily during the war. And when they bump in other people's houses, we protest. But not enough. We oppose them, but not enough. I was in my bed. And on my bed, America was fun. Invisible house by invisible house by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun. In the six months of a disastrous rain, in a house of money, in a street of money, in a city of money, in a country of money, oh great. But of money, we for Dimas lived happily during the war. And um, what I'm going to read next is a number of poems from a story of the Republic. The first one is called Gunshot. Gunshot. Our country is a stage. But soldiers march into town, public assemblies are officially prohibited. But today, neighbors flock to the piano music from Sony and Alfonso's puppet show in Central Square. Some of us have climbed up into the trees, others hide beyond benches and telegraph posts. From Petya, the deaf boy in the front row sneezes, the surgeon puppet collapses, shrieking. He stands up again, snort, shake his fist at the laughing audience. The army surgeon swerves into the square, disgorging his servant surgeon. Disperse immediately! Disperse immediately. The puppet mimics in a wooden falsetto. Everyone freezes except Peter, who keeps giggling. Someone claps a hand over his mouth. The surgeon turns towards the boy, raising his finger. Yo! Yo! The puppet raises a finger. Sonia watches her puppet. The puppet watches the surgeon. The surgeon watches Sonia and Alfonso. But the rest of us. Watch Peter lean back, gather all the speed in his road, and launch at the surgeon the sound you do not hear. Leave the gulls of the bottom. Next one. A soldier's march. Alfonso covers the boy's face with a newspaper. Podium people, most of us strangers, watch Sonia kneel by Peter, shot in the middle of the street. She picks up his spectacles, shining like two coins, balances them on his nose. Absurd this moment, how it convulses. Snow falls on the ducks, run into the streets like medics. Fourteen of us watch, Sonia kisses his forehead, her shadow hole torn in the sky. It shimmers the park benches, porch lights. We see in Sonia's open mouth the nakedness of the whole nation. She stretches out beside the little snowman napping in the middle of the street. As picking up its ballet, the country runs. Alfonso in snow. You're a liar. I wish for to myself there for minutes, etc., to make a man. Next 
deafness and insurgency begins. Our country woke up next morning and refused to hear soldiers. In the name of pity, we refused. At 6 a.m., when soldiers compliment the girls in the alley, they go slide by pointing to their ears. At 8, the bakery door is shut and soldiers in one of faith, so he's the best customer. At 10, Mama Gala chokes, no one hears you at the gates of the soldiers' barracks. By 11 a.m., arrests begin. Our hearing does not weaken, but something silent in us trenches. After two few families are they arrested, and homemade puppets out of their windows, the streets empty, but for the squeaks of strings and the tap, tap against the buildings of wooden feet and feet in the ears of the town, snow falls. Alfonso stands and swivel. My people, you were really something fucking fun. On the morning of the first arrest, our men, once frightened and bound to their beds, now stand up like human must. Daphne's passes through us like a police. We still hear the night testify. Each of us comes home, shuts at the wall at the stove, at the refrigerator, let himself forgive me. I was antagonist with you, life to you. I stand unswerable. I run, etc. With my legs and my hands, etc. I run down Wasenka Street, etc. Whoever least in front you, for the father on my time sent you, for our argument that ends, sent you, for death, Lord, such fire from a march you never leave. That map of bones and open bars. I watched the surgeon tell that the boy take iron and fire in his mouth. His face on the asphalt, that map of bone and open it was. It is the air. Something in the air wants us too much. The earth is still. The table guards eat cucumber sandwiches. This first day, soldiers examine the ears of bartenders, accountants, soldiers. The wicked then silence does to soldiers. They tear Gora's wife from her bed like a door of a bus. Observe this moment. How he convulses. The body of the boy lies on the asphalt like a pepper. The body of the boy lies on the asphalt like the body of a boy. I touch the voice, feel the pulse of the heart, and I stay up wordless and do not know why I am alive. We tiptoe the city, Sonia and I, between the eaters and gardens of Rhode Island gates. Be courageous, we say, but no one is courageous as a sound we do not hear lifts the bird of the board. Before the war, we made a child. I kissed a woman whose freckles serve us the neighbors. She had a mole on her shoulder which she displayed like a medal for bravery. For trembling lips, man come to bed. Her hair would have fallen in the middle of the conversation, man come to bed. I woke in my barber shop of thoughts, yes. I see the off to bed on the chair of my hairy arm, but parted lips, man bite my Parted lips line under the courtship, Sonia, the things we did.
soldiers saying with us. Soldiers saying with us. They fire. As the crowd of women flees inside the nostrils of searchlights. My God, have a photograph of this. The piazza's bright hair soldiers drag Peter's body and his head bang the stairs. I feel through my wife's shirt the shape of a child. So this drag Peter up the stairs and homeless dog being as philosophers understand everything and bark and bark. I now on a bridge with no camouflage of speech. A body wrapped in the body of my pregnant wife tonight. You don't die. And don't die. The earth is still. A helicopter I both my wife and earth. A man cannot flip a finger at the sky because each man is already a finger flipped at the sky. Lullaby. Lullaby. Little daughter. Rain water, snow, and branches protect me. White washed walls and neighbors' hands off. Child of my aprons, little earth of six pounds. My white hair keeps your sleep lit. While the child sleeps, Sonia undresses. She scraps me until I spit soapy water peak. She smiles. A man should smell better than his country. So she's a silence of a woman who speaks again. Silence knowing that silence is what moves us to speak. She throws my shoes and glasses in the air. I'm of deaf people and I have no country, but a bastard and an infant and a marriage bed. Soaping together that is sacred to us, washing each other's shoulders. You can fuck anyone, but with whom can you see it in water? Poem bombardment. My body runs in a Loman street, my clothes in a pillowcase. I look for a man who looks exactly like me to give him my Sonia, my name, my shirt. It has begun. Neighbors climb the trolleys at the fish market, breaking all their moments in half. Trolleys burst like intestines in the sun. Pavel shots, I am so fucking beautiful, I cannot stand it. Two boys still holding tomato sandwiches, hopping a trolley slide. So you say, but their faces, their ears. I can't find my wife where I eat my pregnant wife. I, a body, an adult male awaits to explode like a hand grenade. It has begun. I see the blue canary of my country. Big breadcrumbs from each citizen size. Big breadcrumbs from my neighbor's hair. The snow lifts the earth and falls straight up as a tree. To have a country. So. Into walls, into street lights, into lunch. Yes, my runs in the walls, into street lights, into love, and one the blue canary of my country. Watches their legs as they run and fall.
ਅਸੀਂ ਗਵਾ ਦੇ ਬੋਚ ਬਾਸੰਤ ਕਾ ਸੀਚਜ਼ਨਸ ਡੂ ਨਾਟ ਨੋ ਦੇ ਅਰੇ ਵਿਦ ਦਮ ਤਪਖਤ ਇਨ ਅ ਟਾਈਮ ਆਫ ਵਾਰ ਇਸ ਇਜ਼ ਅ ਰਿਪੀਟਡ ਡਾਕੂਮੈਂਟ ਆਵ ਲਾਫਰ ਬੋਚ ਗਾਟ they have something to tell that not even they can hear clamber in a center square of this bomb without city you will see one neighbor gives a cigarette another gives a dog a pint of sunlit beer you will find god like a dumb pigeon's beak i am pecking every which way at astonishment ਪਾਰਨ ਸਕਵਾਡ ਆਮ ਬਾਲਕਨਸ ਸਨਲਾਈਟ ਆਮ ਪੋਪਲਸ ਸਨਲਾਈਟ ਆਨ ਆਰ ਲਿਪਸ ਟੁਡੇ ਨੋ ਵਨ ਇਸ ਸ਼ੂਟਿੰਗ ਅ ਗਰਲ ਕਾਸ ਹਰ ਹੇਰ ਵਿਦ ਇਮੇਜਨਰੀ ਸੀਦਰ ਦ ਸੀਦਰ ਸਨ ਸਨਲਾਈਟ ਹੋ ਹੇਰ ਆਨ ਸਨਲਾਈਟ ਆਨ ਅਦਰ ਗਰਲ ਮਿਕਸ ਅ ਪੇਰ ਆਫ ਸ਼ੂਸ ਫਰਮ ਅ ਸਲੀਪਿੰਗ ਸੋਲਜਰਸ ਕਵਰਡ ਵਿਦ ਲਾਈਟ a soldier spoiled and gave but as gave at them what do they see tonight they shot 50 people at lorna street i see down to right and tell you what i know a child learns the world by putting it in her mouth a girl becomes a woman and a woman earned body they blame you for all this and they seek in the body what does not live in the body the dance people watch them take off on now each of us is a witness stand basenka what is that watch for soldiers throw off from the barabinsky on the sidewalk we we'll let them take you all of us covered what we don't say we carry in our suitcases our coat pockets our nostrils across the street they watch him with fire hoses for his scream then he stops so much sunlight a teacher falls off a clothes line and an old man stops picks it up presses it to his face neighbors line up to watch him alone on a sidewalk like a valley we lock the door in so much sunlight each of us is a witness stand they take alfonso and no one stands up our silence stands up for us and the last poem you bring it over very close home it's called in a time of peace in a time of peace inhabitant of earth for 40 something years i once found myself in a peaceful country i was the neighbor so open their phones to watch a cop demanding a man's driver license and when a man reaches for his wallet the cop shoots in the the car window shoots peaceful then go amazing hours in the country in which a boy shot by police lies on a pavement for us we see in his open mouth the nakedness of the whole 
meixa. Vi bote. Bote asas. Bote. A pátria. A fulpona. Lá é seu nefeto. Exato. Lá que fulpona. A fulpona. Isso é peaceful. Country. And it clips our citizens' bodies effortlessly. The way the president's wife dreams her torments. All of us still have to do the hard work of dentist appointments, of remembering to make a summer salad, basil, tomatoes, and to enjoy tomatoes and a little salt. This is a time of peace. I don't hear gunshots, but watch birds splash over the backyards of the suburbs. How bright is the sky as the avenue spins on its axis. How bright is the sky. Forgive me. How bright. Thank you so much. Ilya, that was phenomenal. I hope you're getting a chance to uh, read the, the chat. Um, I, I don't even know where to begin, um, but I will, I'll let the audience know that uh, Molly will be coming to join us soon. We're gonna start the uh, Q&A. And I get to uh, ask the first question. Uh, and I'm going to leave uh, the craft and process questions uh, for other people to ask uh, because I have one very specifically that I want to start with. Um, both of you are poets who are described by others as kind and generous time and time again. I mean, if, if going back to the introductions tonight, um, Molly, you spoke of Ilya as being kind and generous. Misha spoke of you as being kind and generous. And I see that um, in both of you as well. Ilya, more through your Twitter feed than knowing you personally. But Molly has um, been so kind to me more times than I can count. Um, and it's not a facade. I mean, it's, it's consistent and everybody knows it. Um, it goes deep. Uh, and I would add to the, the um, kind and generous, I would add soft and open while not shying away from confronting pain and difficult realities. Um, so I want to know, you know, as, as we have an audience here, um, what, how do you do that? Why do you do that? Um, and yeah, how, what could we learn from you about that mentality? Ilya, I'm eager to let you go first. Uh, sure, sure. Well, um, in spirit of this question, I do want very much to thank you for your kindness, Molly, and for your beautiful poems to begin with. Um, as the question is really, why are human trying to stay human? You know, why are we... Uh, continuing the conversation with each other and with those who came before us, if, if I understood it correctly. Um, I think if one is a writer, one realizes pretty quickly that it is impossible to just keep looking in the mirror and remain a writer. Um, so you can write pretty good one or maybe 10 mirror poems but after that, you kind of dry up immediately because um, your vocabulary dries up, your emotional intelligence dries up. Um, you want to speak to that. There's no other way to be a person of words if not be surrounded by them. And also, I think in a time of crisis, and we seem to be living in time of crisis for as long as I have been in this country, which is since 1993. Um, in a time of crisis, you realize pretty quickly that 
inside Croatia, there's a lot of tenderness, a lot of kindness. Um, the, the terrible things happening, and we must speak about them, but people also get married and have children and bury their parents. And how can we not speak about that? Yeah, I think that that's, that's exactly right. I don't know how anyone, I don't know how anyone makes anything if not from a place of openness and tenderness and outward lookingness and, and generosity. You know, I, I love the way Leo phrased it, you can only look at yourself in the mirror for so long. You know, good, good work comes from being attentive to the the world and how can you be attentive to the world and want to be anything other than as generous and gentle and uh, and uh, alive and awake as you possibly can be because there is no other response to to crisis and to violence and to and to difficulty than to than to speak back to it um, with as much with as much kindness and as much assuredness as you can as you can muster. Thank you. Um, we're gonna sort of do a rotation here between Sam, Emma, and me asking questions from the audience. So I'll just remind the audience that um, you can put your questions in the Q and A uh, feature. And um, Molly, at some point during this evening, as you're answering questions, Jordi Alonzo has asked that you incorporate the way that you say bananas, since <laughs> Men Misha mentioned it in your introduction. So that's your that's your challenge on top of everything else tonight. Sam or Emma, would one of you like to ask a question? I can I can go ahead and start off. So. Molly, I'm obviously familiar with you as a member of the Kenyan faculty, as a teacher here, and Ilya, I was pleasantly surprised to find out that you are a teacher as well. So I'm wondering, as teachers who are also writers, to what degree do you find yourselves influenced by your students? To what degree do your students influence what you create? Um, I can say a little a little bit about that um, before before Elliot doesn't sure he'll have he'll have much more eloquent things to say. Um, but I think that um, the thing I love so much about teaching um, is that is that every day, regardless of whether I feel it, um, I feel like it is my job to go into the classroom and uh, ex express wonder to my students and give them the opportunity to wonder and to discover things and to be uh, excited about things. And so often um, the, the discoveries and the delight and the intelligence um, and the creativity that they echo back at me is so much greater than what I felt like I was bringing to them or what I felt capable of in the moments that I stepped into the classroom. And I would say that in that way, my students and my teaching um, is hugely important to, to what I do because I don't think it's possible to stay a poet without staying awake to the way wonder and tragedy live alongside each other and to the, the sort of enormous flexibility and openness of language. Um, and being a teacher is the thing that keeps me most consistently, most happily, most actively awake um, to that and to that simultaneity. Thank you, that is very beautiful. I love that phrase, the turn of phrase, alongside each other. I think it is very important. I think the best teachers are not those who leave the room and all the students think, oh, wow, they are a genius. No, I think the best teachers are those who leave the room, at least in my experience, and the students then oh, wow, I can learn something about my own possibility, how I can grow. Um, to my mind, teaching has been very um, important uh, to me. And many of the students I had uh, ended up being friends for many years later, partly because um, 
in the beginning of the class, let's say very practically in the first part of the semester, we would all make sure to learn craft together so that we have a shared vocabulary of craft. Even in a workshop I gave today, which was about one hour, the first half was about very basic things like nouns, verbs, adjectives, and so forth, images, alambrics. But once we have the shared vocabulary, we can go look at the text by others or our own, and it's amazing to watch how another human mind read the same number of words on the page. I can tell you how many times I learned it by sharing a text that I have shared maybe 20 years in a row already. And then a student would raise a hand and point something entirely new about that text that they have not noticed. And that is a kind of conversation that freshens up literature for us, that makes it alive. A new game. My mind. Um, I can go ahead and ask the next question. So first, I just wanted to say thank you to you both. I've had the pleasure to be in two of Molly's classes. And in my first class with her, we actually read Deaf Republic. So it's been really wonderful to return to these poems tonight and, and hear them read. Um, and I went to um, Ilya's workshop earlier today and he kind of asked us to think, think about our own relationship to language. And so I'm curious how you both would, would describe your relationship to language. Do you see language as, as like a companion, um, a parent, a, a lover, something embodied or something maybe stranger? Um, and then, yeah, specifically to Ilya, like how your relationship to language has has maybe shifted or expanded in your native language, Russian, and then now English. Um, yeah. Thank you. It's a wonderful question, impossible to answer, but I'll give it a try. Um, there are so many ways to speak about it. Russian literature uh, is so much younger than English literature, modern Russian poetry tradition began with Alexander Pushkin writing his famous great novel and verse, Evgeny Anidin, uh, Russian epic. But when did he write it? He wrote it in, say, 1824, was one of the years when he was writing it. What in the world is 1824 for English literature? You had centuries of literature before that in English. So, of course, coming from a different culture, one is immediately change it. Um, very little poetry that is popular in Russia is not Ramit, for example, which is very different from contemporary American tradition, of course. Uh, but there are so many other things. Um, for example, talking about poetry to most of my friends, uh, contemporaries writing in America today, most people would tell you, oh, it is so important to stay strange, to learn how to be strange, so your strangeness is memorable to others. And um, it is true if you're born with the English, but if it's not your native language, you're kind of different by definition. And in uh, my case, it was far more difficult to make sense than to be strange. I can be strange 24 seven. Uh, but to be child and have this virtual handshake with the video. Um, that was not easy and I had to learn that. So it's, um, it made me realize that everybody has a very individual relationship to speech. And um, even strangeness, what is strange in Georgia, might not at all be strange in Ohio, unlike, and, and likewise. You know. So it's, um, what I encourage uh, my students and friends to do when we speak about poems is something I probably learned it most from Lorca, and I mentioned that quote I sent to your class today. Poet is a professor of five senses, not a professor of creative writing at the university, but five senses. And when we can establish a central relationship with words, 
physical sexual relationship, then it is very likely that the reader will connect because they will to have that kind of relationship. I love that idea that it's it's so much more difficult to to make to make sense than to be strange. And I think it's funny because that um, that feels in some ways like my my relationship with language as well. Even though English is my is my native language, and I, I wonder if it has something to do with um, having an embodied experience that always feels like it needs translation um, and like it's not fully comprehensible to. Um, many other people, most other people in the world. Um, I think that language um, has always felt to me like the only limited tool I have to try to make things explicable um, and to try to, to, to build um, not only a, a translation of myself for the world, but also to build a universe in which I, I feel as if I can exist um, fully as my Self. Um, and I just have to say that I know Emma as a, a student who is excellent at asking genius and unanswerable questions and Ilya as a person who is excellent at answering unanswerable questions. And so it was such a pleasure to, um, to get to see to see those those two things interact. Uh, if I may just to follow up a little bit and also the Jennifer in the Q&A asked it a question about writers who influence it and so forth. And of course, we can talk for the next 24 hours about other writers, but there is a person in this room who's actually not a poet, who really influenced my way of thinking, although she may be a poet, but I mostly know her as a great scholar. Uh, probably the, to my mind, definitely the living uh, classic of disability studies, Rosa Marie Garland Thompson, who I think is in the audience here today. And um, when I was an undergraduate, um, I just happened to come across her book. I think it came out around the same time called Extraordinary Bodies. And I opened it on a phrase that stayed with me for decades and was very important for my book. And the phrase said something like, um, and I'm paraphrasing, a disabled body should move outside of the realm of the hospital room into the realm of political minority. And you can read it in so many ways, that phrase you can read it obviously in today's uh, culture where most people in the pandemic don't have health insurance. Uh, or you can read it in terms of language, uh, in terms of poetry, how sometimes a poet from a different culture, or a different language or a different time can uh, teach the mainstream something new and something different, you know. Um, and it was very influential for me. So I would recommend that the book is called Extraordinary Bodies, check it out. I just, I wanna second, second that recommendation. It's an extraordinary text and say, thank you so much for being here, Rosemary. Your work has an enormous amount to me as well. And I kind of can't believe that you're in the room. <laughs> thank you both. Um, and Donna, who's in the audience, wants to thank you as well. Lots of thanks going around tonight. Um, and uh, she writes, you both write about topics personal and emotionally complex. Part of your craft is how you telescope in and out of that emotion to bring the reader into the experience without submerging us so deeply that we're lost in it. Is this something you consciously think about with your work or is it just an organic aspect of how you write in general. Ellie, do you want to take that? Sure, I'm, I'm still just reading the okay. subtitles. So just, just one moment. Um, the question seems to be, uh, you write about personal and emotionally complex part of our craft and how do you tell the Cope out of that emotion to bring the reader into experience without submersion. Okay, um, it's a complicated question. I wish I knew the answer. My answer would probably be slow down and um, think about elements of craft you're using and what they're doing, each one, 
the best example I can give, um, I teach right now at an engineering school. Most of my students are engineers. And um, I had this amazing experience when I first started teaching here. Um, when a student raised a hand when we were discussing a poem by Dylan Thomas, a really famous poem, called The Not Go Gentle Into the Good Night. And a student raises a hand and says, but without alliteration and assonance, that very first line of the poem would be so sentimental. Do not go gentle into that good night. And that's exactly right. The poet uses that craft to keep you from submerging into sentiment. So you're paying attention to the music, you're enjoying the music, and then the emotion hits you, and you don't know from where, because you're so attuned to the music of the craft. So I guess my answer would be your emotion of the poem, or the thought of the poem, the ideas of the poem, you need to go hand in hand with what poetic devices you're using, and they need to contribute to each other. So I even, you know, when I talk to students, I would say, get different colors of pencils, red, green, yellow, and so forth. And underline different poetic devices in your form with different colors, and then see which ones are you using and how are you using them? And could you make them more vivid somehow? Yeah, I love, I love the way that, that Ilya explains the kind of craft, um, elements that allow for for what you're calling telescoping, um, Madonna. And I think, at least in my own work, that that sensation of 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 telescoping in and out, or of sort of taking your your foot on and off the, the gas pedal of that emotion, probably comes from from not only an attention to what Ilya is talking about, which is the the awareness that that. You can't you can't be in the same emotional register all the time without it, it seeming overly sentimental um, or or uncomplex. But it also comes from um, my own ability to live inside a inside a poem or inside a line at a particular moment, and then and then need to need to move away into another into another register. Um, and and I think that's a that's a, a time when I hope the experience of being the writer of a poem and the reader of a poem are attuned, um, and I can kind of change the change the tension and the tenor um, when the reader might need it and when, when I need it. <laughs> sure, so I have a question just for Ilya, sorry, Molly, um, but I personally am fascinated by translation and by the art of translation. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how you go about translating the works of others. Because when I think about translation, I think there are two possible ways you can approach it. You can be authentic and according to whatever that author's original vision was, or you can try to make whatever you're translating your own piece. So which one of those do you prioritize? And is there a balance between them when you're going about it? Yeah, um, let me maybe type in just something. Um, I type it in a chart, in a chart, the last name of a person who had a wonderful many thousand pages long casebook on theories of translation. Um, there, there are so many. Um, perhaps every translator, just like every poet has a theory of what poetry is, other translator has two or three theories and what the translation is, depending on what poet they're translating. Um, translating from Russian is kind of an insane in enterprise to begin with, because the literature is so much younger. Uh, if just think if Marina Tsvetaeva translated her with another poet, Jean Valentin. When Marina Tsvetaeva was writing her poem, she was a great modernist. Um, Russian, modern Russian literature since say Pushkin or even before Pushkin was less than 200 years old. Who is qualified to translate from poetic tradition that is less than 200 years old? Even if literature was older than that when Milton was there, just think about that. So it's anthropological impossibility. And so I say Russians love to rhyme. Of course they love to rhyme, the literature is so young. 
and there's so much more possibility left to return. So when we think about those poetic devices such as meter, rhyme, images, we don't just translate them, but we have to think about what do they mean for our culture today, for our poetic traditions today. Because you can translate it and make it exactly equivalent, but that equivalent would be very different for the reader of 2021 USA. To my mind, I almost never translate alone, even though I'm a native speaker and should be able to do it easily. I don't do it because I need another, a collaborator who will hold my hand and say, it's okay to let go. Otherwise, I would probably keep translating the same seven lines for the next 20 years. Uh, simply because how else do you find this balance between such different cultures? Um, most of my translations, I, I would personally not call translations. I would call them versions, and I have called them homages, in fact. Um, simply because, um, to my mind, cultural differences is such huge. But there are great poets in translation. Somebody like a Polish poet, Wysawa Szymborska, in English, is one of the best poets in English in the last, what, 20, 30 years. So it is very possible to translate. Um, somebody like Dante gets translated every year. Every year, in the last 100 years, you will have a new Dante published in English. It's kind of amazing, right? Uh, it also will tell you a lot about the history of our very own language if you compare, say, Robert Pinsky Dantes to Pope's Dantes, to Longfellow's, and so forth and so on. So um, there is no one theory, and it would be foolish of me in the Q&A to say, do this, don't do that. Um, I would recommend taking that when you have time, take a look at the wonderful, very clear uh, case book by Daniel Waysford. I think it came out from Oxford, but maybe Cambridge, don't, don't quote me on that. One of the big university presses. And it will uh, give you a lot of ideas to play with, beginning with St. Jerome, who was quote unquote, first translator of the Bible from, uh, uh, from Latin into Greek. Um, I'm gonna pull another question from the Q and A. So Jen asked you both, how has your creative process been over the past year in the pandemic? I know some writers have been very prolific and others have been dormant. What has this year been like for you? Um, I, have a, I have a depressing, slightly embarrassing answer to that question, which is that I've written very little um, over the past year. I think that um, this time has been one that has, um, demanded my energy in other ways and also stopped me of a lot of the kind of, of wonder that I um, I think about as being integral to, to, to that work. But I will say that I, um, I've, I've read a lot and particularly in this sort of latter half of the pandemic, my reading life has really come back to me. Um, and I'm someone who, who believes really strongly that um, we have to be reading to be, to be good writers. And so I'm, I'm hoping that all this, all this reading is, is storing up for the, for the writing to, to come back and, and come forward. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it's important to be realistic about the fact that, that we're not always gonna be producing the way we wanna be producing. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately I have been dealing with a lot of illness in the family. So it's been a difficult time for that reason. Um, in other parts of like teaching was um, much easier for me in the pandemic actually, because um, a lot more one-to-one -one can be done, a lot more time for one-to-one -one is available. Um, and I can read the subtitles. So, um, and they're at 24 uh, seven for the students in a way that I wasn't able to do before. You know, you have to drive to university and park and so forth and go to meetings a lot more. And uh, technology makes it easier. Um, attentiveness on line by line basis um, has been there in many ways because more times is there. So it has been a good teaching semester. We have a question from Janet and this is a good one. 
Um, they're all good, <laughs> I should say, but I, mean, I, don't, I hadn't thought about this one. Um, Janet asks, when you decide, how do you decide that a poem is finished? Uh, I'm happy to go or I'm happy to be quiet either way. No, I'm eager to hear your answer, Ilya. Well, uh, my answer is probably silly. It's a famous Charlie Sim quote. The poems are never finished, they abandon it. Um, I, I guess it really depends on what you're writing. Um, if you're writing a song, um, you know it is done when it's memorable. If you're writing a character, you know it is done when they feel alive to you. Um, I can just put it away for two years and then come back two years later and uh, it's very easy to see. But I realize when you're a student and you have a test due, that two years will might not work. So in that case, I would recommend, I might have recommended to students today, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, read it backwards from last line to the first line. And ask yourself on a line by line basis, is this line beautiful enough, interesting enough? And uh, ask that about every line. And uh, if they are, then you're probably closer to being done because then the question is, is the whole bigger than the sum of its parts? And mm -hmm. if that is done, then God bless you, you're better than me. Is the whole bigger than the sum of its parts? That's a wonderful way to phrase a question that I think I'm trying to ask myself all the time, but have never quite so so clearly articulated. Um, and I second Ilya's advice about if you're looking for for practical ways to to um, approach the finish line or to revise, reading things backward, reading things aloud, um, recording yourself reading things and playing it back. Um, just ways to sort of distance yourself from a piece a little bit. Um, and also and also give yourself, as Ilya says, a kind of line by line um, experience with it. Sometimes I have a sensation that a poem is done when I'm editing it and I realize that I'm making it worse. Um, I sometimes hit a moment where I'm doing revision and I realize that the poem is, is getting is getting worse in revision instead of better. And that's usually a good signal that I should at least temporarily put it down and walk away. Um, but I'm also going to make a plug for readers you trust. Um, Sometimes I don't know if a poem is finished until I send it to someone I, I respect and admire and get the, the perspective of someone who is outside of me and outside of my, my own head. And um, writing to a certain degree is always a solitary act, but I think that, um, that finishing, finishing something is to me always at its best when it's a, when it's a communal act, um, as, as reading will, will one day be. That's helpful. That's very helpful. Um, I hate that we are not going to get to all of the questions in the chat, but thank you audience for some really great questions and compliments, Ilya and Molly. I hope that you take a moment <laughs> to read the questions as well as the chat because um, they're packed with, with kind words and, and good things. But I wanted to end with a question um, connected to our project that we're doing for this, for this whole school year at Kenyon. I mentioned it earlier, it's called In My Time, A Narrative Space, and it's an attempt to give the community um, a place to read and to connect and uh, wrestle with texts and to write. So uh, my question is if each of you, Ilya and Molly, would leave our audience with a, uh, a writing prompt that they can take from the evening and uh, tackle on their own, maybe tackle's too harsh a word, dance with um, after this evening is over. Um, I can start because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that the one you will actually want to be left with is Ilya's, so I will let him have the, have the final word here. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a little bit of a writing prompt from an exercise that I did with some students in a class I visited today um, which is maybe connected a little to Ilya's, to Ilya's read, read your poem backwards, line by line advice, which is that um, I invite you all to think of a story or a memory 
that you feel like you know incredibly well. Maybe it's a story about your life that you tell all the time, or maybe it's a memory you find yourself revisiting all the time. Um, and I would invite you to write it out. But when you write it out, I would invite you to write it backwards. And I mean, not only begin at the end and work your way to the beginning, but I mean, literally write the whole thing in reverse so that every action, every motion, every gesture is happening backwards, like an unwinding. If you want a brilliant example of this, there are two beautiful poems, both called Palindrome, one by the poet Lazel Mueller um, and another by the poet Nate Marshall. Um, and they're extraordinary artifacts of what can happen when we tell a story in the opposite way that it would occur to us to tell it. This is really terrific, I love this. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure you know, but I don't know if others in the audience do so. Just so we are all on the same page, it was one of Emily Dickinson's favorite things to do, according to Susan Schaaf's My Emily Dickinson. In that book, she says that Emily Dickinson loved to read Branta backwards. So in that backwards exercise, why don't you read your favorite poet backwards and see if you can come up with anything? Um, but if I, you permit me, it's not quite an exercise, more um, a kind of a process. Um, consider having your whole bookshelf become your notebook. Um, go to your bookshelf and take away the book. Just, just start with maybe this one shelf so I don't create a huge mass in your house. Uh, take the books out of alphabetical order and arrange them by music or by images or by passions. And inside the music say, arrange by your favorite line breaks or your favorite rhymes or your favorite inner rhymes. And then look at those books and ask yourself, okay, so I took this book, it's in my section for favorite images. Which are the images that if someone wakes me up in the middle of the night, I will say, yeah, that is this poet's image. And then imitate those. And then do the same thing with specific sounds, specific line breaks and so forth. And then combine them, make a little soup, then change completely the uh, subject. Today in a class, we were taking elegy and uh, looking at two poets who wrote elegies. But what if you take that as a prompt and make it into a wedding poem? Take all the forms that you need and completely change the mood. In other words, look at what you love and then change it. It will still be what you love, you don't love with it, you can't avoid it. What you love is your fate, but you can change your fate, at least on page. Give it a try. Sorry, I'm frantically writing <laughs> this down. Um, wow, okay. Well, we have some work to do as we leave, um, but you all have filled us with fantastically beautiful passages, difficult things to think about, hopeful things to think about. And um, we are very appreciative of your taking this time with us, Ilya and Molly. Um, I'll thank Sam and Emma also for joining us on the screen. These are our, I, ne I never introduced you two, but these are our Kenyon College, uh, Kenyon Review Associates who are representing the, uh, the student population that we get to work with. And uh, thank you also attendees for um, being so wonderfully attentive and uh, active in the chat and with the great questions. Um, yeah, so thank you. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna uh, step, I was gonna give you all a chance to say goodbye if you want to, <laughs> but I'm gonna also do some announcements, um, so. Uh, here we go. Before we bid you a good evening, I will remind you that you can purchase Ilya and Molly's books at our bookshop link, which you can find in the chat. 
And I will also invite you to join us again in the next few weeks for more readings as we welcome Shangri Lee, Misha Rai, Linda Hogan, and Tiana Clark just in the next like five weeks, I think, uh, to the reading series. Uh, and finally, I will remind you to keep your eyes on your inbox for more information about this summer's Kenyan Review Ross event series. I hope you all have a wonderful night and uh, stay well. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you. Thank you.